Well, good morning, and once again, thank you so much for allowing Family Life to come into your homes. Uh, just imagine that we are right there with you. The worship team is right there in your living room. I'm, I'm there with you. And most importantly, we're meeting with God. We're encouraging each other. We're praying together. Uh, we're studying God's word together. And we're just inspiring each other uh, to just really move on with God. Uh, this morning, today, I'm launching a, a three-week series called The New Normal. And this is a concept that's been talk, talked about uh, very much if you've uh, been watching the media or the news the past few weeks. And if you think about it, it makes perfect sense. Um, we're, we're living in a world that, that has drastically changed over the last eight to 10 weeks. We see people wearing masks and gloves when they enter into public places. Uh, people avoiding contact, no shaking hands, no hugging, trying to stay six feet apart. And we see, we drive down the road and we see many empty businesses, businesses that used to be thriving centers, economic centers of activity, and they're, and they're empty. You know, schools, restaurants, hair salons, churches, and although some of them are starting to come back, it's just been a unique and a strange uh, situation. To go into grocery stores and to see the shelves empty, that's just a a new, a new phenomenon for us. And hey, I know it's kind of, we're kind of past this now, but hey, what was up with the toilet paper? I'm telling you, we need a whole sociological study on that one. That was a strange thing. But, you know, we're not used to seeing shortages. Uh, we're not used to having shortages in meat and milk and eggs or even cleaning supplies. It's just, it's just uh, you know, not what we're used to. And we're certainly not used uh, to... Um, being told that we can only buy a certain amount of something, having our, our buying power limited. We're not used to that. And I think we've all had conversations in houses and with friends and maybe with family. And the conversation goes something like this. When are we going to get back to normal? You know, when will everything get back to normal, back to the way that it used to be? And honestly, uh, I don't think it will ever go back to the way it was. And so we have to consider, you know, what the new normal is going to be. Sure, schools are going to reopen. Churches will start meeting again. But many things will never go back uh, to the way they once were. And that is not all a bad thing. You know, I've, I've noticed that this pandemic has moved many people back to God. Uh, it has caused people to reevaluate their priorities, and it has broken uh, the spirit of self-sufficiency that I believe has dominated American and Western culture for many years. And, you know, the, talking about self-sufficiency, we've gone from thinking we have so much power and control over what happens to us, you know, kind of like we control our own destiny, to really realizing that we don't have very much power. When things change drastically, we just follow suit. And so obviously that is, you know, that is, that is a, a good thing. And, you know, I've said many times that God did not cause this situation, but I think he's going to use it to bring about some dramatic and helpful changes uh, into, into our lives. You know, many times we know we need to change. How about you're watching this morning? How many of you know something that needs to change and you know how to change it, but you just drag your feet. But when something shocking happens, when something just kind of smacks you upside the head, you kind of, kind of get in gear and start doing it. And so one of the good things about this pandemic is, I think it's really brought kind of a shock effect into our lives. And, and we realize that maybe we need to adjust some things in our life. We don't need to wait for six months. We don't need to wait till Monday. We need to start today. We need to start adjusting some things in our life. In this series, I'm going to have two main uh, texts for this series. And the first one comes from Matthew chapter 11, verse 28 through 30. In the message, it says this, are you tired are you worn out? Are you burned out on religion? Come to me. Get away with me and you'll recover your life. Now, see, we got to recover our life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. 
walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me and you'll learn how to live freely and lightly. And that's an incredible thing when I think about that. You know, the, the first line says, are you burned out on religion? And I just want you to know if you're burned out on religion, uh, God never meant for us to have religion. He meant for us to have a personal relationship with him. So if you're burned out on religion, good, set it on fire, get rid of it. It's not about religion. It's not about uh, what kind of church you go to. It's about your relationship with Jesus. But it says, keep company with me and you'll learn how to live freely and lightly. And, and I want to just suggest to you that the reason so many times we're heavy, the reason so many times we feel drained and worn out is because we're not keeping company with Jesus. And, and so we got to get back to that for the new normal. We're facing a virus that has a name. It's COVID-19. And, and we're praying for everyone that has been affected by COVID-19. You know, 36 million Americans have lost their jobs. It's estimated that more than 100,000 businesses are going to go under during this time and they're not going to be able to come back. We know that many people have lost family members or have gotten sick with COVID-19. And I just want you to know, we are praying for you. We're, we're concerned about you. We hate that you're experiencing this. So we, we mourn with you. The Bible says to mourn with those who mourn and to rejoice with those who rejoice. So we mourn with you if you're going through a time of loss and, and we're so sorry for that. And I want you to know that here at Family Life, we are praying for you. We're concerned. We are concerned uh, uh, about you. But there's another virus that has been impacting or plaguing the world for centuries that we never mention. It's the virus of sin. When sin entered the world through Adam and Eve, it brought devastating consequences on our world. And all of the things that we see today that are causing people so much problems, um, anxiety, depression, pain, suffering, um, rejection, self-pity, hatred, all these things have come from the virus of sin. So when it comes to COVID-19, we're all praying for a breakthrough. I mean, everyone, we are, we are hopeful and we're praying that medical experts will come up with a vaccine to cure the illness. So no one has to die from this. So no one has to be fearful of this. But here's the good news. For the virus of sin, the vaccine has already been delivered. God sent his son into the world. He is the cure for the consequences and the pain of sin, the vaccine has already been delivered. The cure has already been delivered. But so many people, millions and millions of people in America and perhaps billions around the world, they have never taken advantage of the cure, the vaccine that God sent. John 3, 16 says, For God so loved the world that he sent his, that he gave his one and only son, so that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but should have eternal life. I'm going to read one more scripture, and this is the second text for our series for the next three weeks, and it comes from 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 23 through 24. And it says this, May, the, may God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through, May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you is faithful, and he will do it. So the word sanctify, may God sanctify you through and through. That means that God is going to keep working in your life through and through to get you to where you need to be. And this is going to set up our three-week spirit. It says, may he sanctify your whole spirit, soul, and body. So for the next three weeks, that's what we're going to be focused on. What is the new normal for your spiritual life? What is the new normal for your soul or your emotional life? And what is the new normal uh, for your physical life, your physical body? And uh, we're going to start, of course, by looking 
at the new normal for our spiritual lives, you know, here's the truth. If we can get our spiritual life in balance, if we can get our spiritual life to a place where it's growing and vibrant, everything else in life will take care of itself. You know, say, well, but but Terry, I have a marriage problem. Well, yeah, but if you have a growing, vibrant spiritual life, if you get to a new normal, if, if, if God is filling your life and helping you to grow, if he's sanctifying you through and through, you'll be a better husband or you'll be a better wife, so your marriage will automatically improve. And I wanna challenge you that in every area of your life, if your spiritual life is in balance, if you find the new normal that you need, um, then I, I guarantee you everything else in life is going to get, get better. When, when our spiritual life is healthy, when it's vibrant, when it's growing, it overflows into every area of our life, into our family, into our work, into our finances. And so we're going to start off by talking about the new normal in our spiritual life. And what I'm going to talk to you today about is, is our spiritual journey. The Bible outlines a spiritual journey that God has for all of humanity. Everyone that's born on earth is invited to go on a spiritual journey with God. And it's the exact same journey for everyone. And it consists of four simple steps. I'm going to introduce those steps to you today. First of all, on the spiritual journey, God wants you to know him personally. In the church world or in the religious world, we call that salvation, to know God personally. When we establish a personal relationship with Jesus, the second thing is this. He wants you to find freedom from all of the past hurts in life. And as I say that, some of you that are watching, your mind is just scrolling because you've, you've gone through so many hurts so many disappointments, so many frustrations in life, and many people just give up on life. The spiritual journey, God doesn't want you to give up. He wants to help you overcome that. The third uh, step in the journey is to discover your purpose. It's a special day in life when you discovered why God puts you here. God has a unique plan for all of us. He's given all of us unique gifts, and abilities. And when we discover that, it really helps us to progress in life. And the fourth thing is this, is to make a difference with your life, to make a difference in life. And I think that's the ultimate goal of everybody. They want to leave a legacy. They want to uh, make a difference with their life, but very few do. And so what I want to do this morning is I want to talk about this formula uh, for our spiritual journey to know God personally, to find freedom from the hurts of life, to discover your purpose, and then to make a difference. I have found this four-part journey, spiritual journey, all through the scripture. I found it in the Old Testament many times. I found it in the New Testament many times. And I want to read a story today that shows a man who was in trouble. And he went on a spiritual journey with Jesus, and his life was never the same. His life was radically transformed. You couldn't even recognize him anymore. And we see all four parts of the spiritual journey in his life. So let's, I'm going to read Matthew, I'm sorry, Mark chapter 5, verse 1 through 15 and 18 through 20. And this is a long text. But as I read it, just listen to the story, and then we're going we're gonna to show the four parts of the spiritual journey in this passage. Mark 5 says this. They went across the lake to the region of the Gerasenes. And when Jesus got out of the boat, a man with an impure spirit came from the tombs to meet him. This man lived in the tombs and no one could bind him anymore, not even with a chain. He had often been chained hand and foot. But he tore the chains apart and broke the irons on his feet. No one was strong enough to subdue him. Night and day among the tombs and in the hills, he would cry out and cut himself with stones. When he saw Jesus from a distance, he ran and fell on his knees in front of him. And he shouted at the top of his voice. This is kind of radical. What do you want with me? Jesus, son of the most high God, in God's name, don't torture me. For Jesus has said to him, come out of this man, you impure spirit. 
Then Jesus asked him, what is your name? He said, my name is Legion, for we are many. And he begged Jesus again and again not to send them out of the area. A large herd of pigs was feeding on the nearby hillside. The demons begged Jesus, send us into the, among the pigs. Allow us to go into them. He gave them permission and the impure spirits came out and went into the pigs. And the herd, about 2,000 in number, rushed down the steep bank into the lake and were drowned. Those tending the pigs ran off and reported this in the town and, and in the countryside. And the people went out to see what had happened. When they came to Jesus, they saw the man who had been possessed by the legion of demons sitting there, dressed in his right mind, and they were afraid. And as Jesus was getting into the boat, the man who had been demon-possessed begged to go with him. And Jesus did not let him, but said, go home to your own people and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how, how he has had mercy on you. So the man went away and began to tell in the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him and all the people <clears throat> were amazed. Oh, well, what an incredible story. We have a demon-possessed man named Legion. Of course, his name wasn't really Legion. Uh, we don't have his real name, but the demons in him were so many. A legion of soldiers in the Roman army was between 4,000 and 6,000 demons. So we can see that this man had thousands of impure spirits in him. So we got a demon-possessed man who's running around naked, and uh, he's cutting himself, and he's howling among the tombs in the cemetery. And even when they subdue him and put chains on his hands and feet, he just... He, he has so much supernatural power from these demonic spirits. He just breaks the chains and, and uh, just an incredible story. I mean, this, it almost reminds you of some scary movie they come out with on Halloween. And, uh, but it wouldn't be PG, man. You got naked people running around and they're shrieking and cutting themselves. And uh, I mean, imagine this. Imagine you're, you're going to a cemetery to visit one of your loved ones who's in heaven. And you pull up there. You're going to go in the cemetery and you look out there. And there's a demon-possessed man who's naked. He's running around the cemetery howling and cutting himself. I mean, I don't know about you, but I say, hey, man, you know, Grandpa, I love you, but I'll come back another day. I mean, I, hey, I'm just, I'm not going to get out. I'm not going to go with that. And I, I was, I was, the story when I was studying this week, it made me think of a, of a different story. Um, when I was, gosh, a preteen, maybe I was 10 years old, and maybe from 9 to about 12, 13 years old, one of the highlights of going to visit my granddad, my, my um, father's parents, was that my granddad, uh, he had this big shed and he had all these bikes. And when the grandkids were coming, he would always make sure all the bikes were ready and all the bikes, all the tires were aired up. And, and I don't know why, but we only took bike rides at night. It had to get dark. And we had the same path we took all the time. <clears throat> And, you know, we would go up here and cut down one street. We would go behind a closed Goodyear tire store. Then we would cut around. And we always cut through the, the, a cemetery. And it's dark, you know. And, you know, cemeteries have trees everywhere. But my granddad, when we get close to the cemetery, he would start taunting us a little bit. Come on now, you have a granddad? And my, grand, my granddad would say, uh, all right, all right. All right, grandkids, you better, you better pedal fast because you know the boogeyman's in there. Listen, he's out there. He's hiding behind a tree. He's probably going to jump out and get you. And, man, we're, listen, we're pedaling like crazy trying to get away from, from, the, from the boogeyman or whatever. But, but it, was, it was a highlight for us. And I never could figure out until later, you know, my granddad was much older. How could my granddad pedal so much faster than we are? We could barely keep up with him. And the, the trick was this. The secret was this. My granddad had a dog that was like, I don't know, man, it was like a Ford Mustang. And he would put the leash around the handlebars, and that dog would drag him for our three-mile trip around. He never pedaled, man. He was, just, he was just flying down, flying down the road. And, but I, I was thinking this week, think about this. I was thinking, of course, my granddad was one of, one of the men in the greatest generation. And uh, just think of how we used to raise kids three generations ago and how we raise them now. 
I mean, just about my granddad, you know, he's, he's taunting us. You better be fast. He's going to get you. I'm telling you, he's going to get you. He's hiding behind the trees in the dark of the cemetery. And uh, man, we, do, we just, we just pedaled faster. And then now we're, to, now we're to a generation that says, hey, if the boogeyman comes after you, call a timeout and ask to go to a safe place. I mean, I mean, think, of, think about where we're at. I, I, you may not find that funny. I find that hilarious. I'm sorry if that offends you, just let it go. But, but think about it. I, you know, we've got to raise, and I said this a few weeks ago, we've got to raise our kids. Hey, man, the boogeyman's out there. He's for real. There's de- demonic forces, and, and there's forces, and, you know, of course, with, with, with God that are more powerful. And so anyway, that's the story that reminded me of. Let's get back to our story here. The region of the Gerasenes, uh, also called Gadara and, and Gardenes, I believe. It's referred to those. Um, it's on the east side of the Sea of Galilee, and it's said to be the center of pagan worship. There was a group of people, they were non-Jewish. We know that because they had pigs, and Jewish people did not eat pork. They didn't eat pigs. It was an unclean animal. They didn't raise them. They didn't sell them. So he goes to this part that's really the descendants of some uh, different cultures that maybe they're polytheistic. And, and, and so that, that's where we're at. And Jesus go. think about this. Jesus goes to this region. This is a very important part of the story. Just to minister to this one man. Because in Mark 4, they're just surviving a storm. And they go to the Gerasenes. And he goes and ministers to this one demon-possessed man that's outside of his mind. And then he gets back on the boat in leaves. And I want you to know that he loves you so much. He loves you so much that he is willing to go out of his way just for you. That ought to make you feel special. He goes out of the way just for you. And uh, so let's go through our story now and talk about our spiritual journey and see if you can find uh, where you're at. First of all, number one, is this man, Legion or whatever his name was, He had a personal encounter with Jesus Christ. That's step one in the journey. This man had probably never heard of Jesus before. Again, after all, he was living in a whole different area uh, to where, you know, Jesus had never been. They weren't Christians. They weren't followers of God. And so most probably he had never even heard of Jesus. But after this day, he had a personal relationship with Jesus. And we find him in the story Sitting next to Jesus, he's fully clothed, he's in his right mind, and he's asking Jesus questions, and and he's listening to Jesus teach. You know, and then when Jesus, when Jesus gets up to leave, we find this man, he follows Jesus to the boat, and he begs Jesus, can I go with you? What does that say? Man, I've had a personal encounter with the Son of God. I've had a personal encounter with Jesus. My old life doesn't doesn't mean anything. He's willing to leave his old life. He's willing to leave his family. This story is also in several other gospels. In Luke 8, it says he used to live in the city. So he, at one time, he was in his right mind. He wasn't demon-possessed. He probably, most probably had a wife and kids and a family. And so his first thought when Jesus saves him when he has this personal encounter with Jesus, is that, man, I don't even want to go back to my life before I was demon-possessed. I want to follow Jesus. And so the first step in our spiritual journey is to know God personally, not to know about him, not, but to know him up close and personal and to commit your life to following him. When you, when you bring, see what happens is we have all these things that are in our life. And Jesus or God may be out here. When you bring God into the center of your life and everything else is out on the periphery. So we see this man. He had a personal uh, encounter with God, that cha- with Jesus, that changed his life. And then that we, sh- we see a commitment to Jesus because he's willing to leave everything and to go and follow Jesus. And, you know, there, there are probably many people watching this morning online who would say, I don't know Jesus up close and personal. I have never totally committed my life to Jesus. And we're going to give you an opportunity to do that in just a little bit. So just, just hang with us. But the new normal for our spiritual lives 
is not knowing that, yes, there is a God and not knowing about Jesus. The new normal is that we get up close and personal with Jesus, that we're sitting at his feet, that we're listening to him, that we're communicating with him, and that we have committed in totality our life to him. Number two, so that's the first step in the journey that this man, we see this formula, he had an encounter with Jesus. Number two is that this man, in an instant, he finds, he finds freedom from all of life's pains, hurts, anxieties. He's just delivered. We don't know, we don't know why or how he came to be demon-possessed. We, we, don't, we don't know that. We know at one time he was normal. One time he had a family. He lived in the city. Perhaps he and his family worshiped idols or idolatry. Uh, or we, we don't know. But we, we, we know that he had a family once. We know they lived in the city once from Luke 8. Here's what we do know about him for sure. 100% factual. He was hurting Many of you watching, you're hurting. You're hurting bad right now. He was lonely. Maybe you're just like this man and you just feel lonely. You feel isolated. You feel like you're, you're out, of, out of sorts. He could not help himself and his friends and family couldn't help him either. That's a bad place to be. I mean, think, think about that. See, without Jesus, the, what happens is the hurts, the pains of life, all these things that happen to us, they put us to a place where we're, where we're hurting and where we're lonely. And, you know, even if we try, we can't help ourselves. And our family members love us. Our friends love us. And they're trying to help us. They don't have the power to help us either. And this man found the power to be delivered, to find freedom in Jesus. He, he had all this stuff. And then one day, Think about this. It was, it, was, it was probably just an ordinary day. Everyone is going about their business in an ordinary way. There seemed to be nothing special about this day. Then the Son of God landed on the shores. And Jesus starts walking toward this man. And Jesus says, you know, impure spirits leave him in the name of Jesus. And they, they come to, to plead with Jesus. They don't want to go. They don't want to go into the abyss. They don't want to go a different place. They want to go into a herd of pigs. We learned that the pigs are much smarter than many of us. They ran and drowned themselves because they didn't want to live with demons in them. Okay? And uh, so here, here, here's the point. In, in one moment, in an instant, he's delivered from these thousands of demons in him. He's not cutting himself anymore. He's not howling anymore. He's not threatening people anymore. We find him totally clothed in sitting, having a conversation with Jesus. And uh, so here's the point for us. We don't have the power to save ourselves, to deliver ourselves. We need a savior. That's, that's the bottom line. And, you know, from what we learned from this story is there, there are two ways that all of us find freedom from all of life's hurts. There's, there's two ways. Sometimes in this story, it happened instantaneously. Instantaneously, <clears throat> excuse me, instantaneously. Jesus spoke and he was delivered instantly. Other times it takes a process to get, a, to get us clean, to get us free. And quite honestly, when we come to Jesus, what happens many times is that instantly, some of the things are gone. Then there's a process to get to total sanctification. <clears throat> so I, I have found, I have found in my life that God uses other people and relationships to help us in the process of finding freedom. And that's why family life, when, when we start meeting again and holding services, we invite you to come. We have a network of small groups and the, they're designed to help people work through the process of becoming free. We have a Celebrate Recovery where people are working through addictions, grief, all kind of things. We have financial studies where people are learning how to get their finances in order. We have marriage small groups where people work on their marriage. We have all kind of things to help you. Uh, but the, the point is this. <clears throat> 
we have a false sense of independence in our lives. We think that we don't need anyone else and that we can do everything on our own. So seriously, how many of you watching today, you have that kind of self-sufficient attitude? I don't need anyone else. I don't want to tell anyone else my issues. I can do it on my own. Some of you have that. So let me ask you a question. If you can do it on your own, how come you're still in bondage? If we could deliver ourselves, we would have been delivered a long time ago. See, we beat ourselves up and, and, and we say things like this. I just need more self-discipline. I just have to try harder. I just need the right, you know, this, this, this. I'm going to start at the new year. I'm going to start on Monday. I'm going to start on Friday. And so let me, let me tell you why many people never get free. And this is going to be a tough one for some to swallow. The reason why many people get, don't get free is because they have so much pride in their life. And to go, God uses relationship and other people to help us. And to go to them, to inquire, to get other people to help you, to encourage you, it requires humility on your part. I'll give you an example. I have people come to me all the time. And, and they say things like, Pastor, could you meet with us? Could you help us? My marriage is in trouble. And I'll say something like, well, of, of course, I'll do anything I can to help you. But can I ask you a qu question? We just had a whole marriage weekend conference for free two weeks ago. Why didn't you go? And they make up a bunch of excuses. Well, we were busy. We had to work. We couldn't find child care. But you know what the real issue is? The real issue is pride. They didn't want to go somewhere where some weaknesses in themselves may be exposed. And what I'm saying, if you want to be free, you have to have humility. You have to pour your life out to God. You have to go to him and say, God, I need you to deliver me from some of this junk in my life. And then you have to get in a process through relationships where people can help you, encourage you, and hold you accountable. Now, here's the best news. We're scared to go to a small group. We're scared to go to things because we think our issues are so bad. And the truth is, everyone has issues. When you go to a small group, you, you, sometimes you leave encouraged. Man, I thought I was in bad shape. They're in worse shape than me. But you have to, it requires humility. The third thing we see is this, is that this man on this day, can you imagine this, this demon-possessed man that's running around naked? Can you imagine that on this day he would ever think that by the time today is over, I'm going to meet a Savior, I'm going to be delivered from all my demons, and I'm going to find my purpose in life. It happened within a couple hours. And here, here's what we see. Uh, I'm going to read one part. It says, as Jesus was getting into the boat, this man who had been demon-possessed begged to go with him. He begged Jesus to go with him. But Jesus did not let him, but said, go home to your own people and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. So the man went away and began to tell in the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him and all the people were amazed. So see, his purpose was not to go with Jesus. His purpose was to go to his own people. His people didn't know Jesus. His people, they were idolaters and they worshiped idols. And can you imagine how powerful this man's testimony must have been? I mean, come on, you know people who are, do you know people who are messed up? I know people who are messed up. And I have met some people after several years and they are not the same person they were. I mean, God has delivered them. God has set them free They've been growing, and they are not the same person. Can you imagine when our man in this story, Legion or whatever his name is, see, everyone knew who he was. I mean, it just goes that way. When you run around naked and are cutting yourselves and breaking chains, word spreads. Can you imagine what it was like when, they came, when, when this man came to them and said, let me tell you about a story about a man who transformed my life and about the mercy that he had on me. Can, and he's sitting there in his right mind. Can you imagine the power of that testimony? 
And I want to show you, I want to show you this. We have a map of the Decapolis. And so uh, when, when they put it up there on, you, on your screen, of course, you can see uh, the Sea of Galilee and there all the way to the east and almost the south there, Gadara. Uh, that, that, if you go close to the Sea of Galilee, that is the Gerasenes. So in the Decapolis, there were 10 cities. Deca means 10 and Polis means city. There were, there were 10 cities. And he went to all 10 of these cities, well-known cities, well-established people, cities that knew nothing about Jesus. He went to every city. We, this man becomes the first, gener, the first missionary that Jesus sent out. This is an amazing story. This is a story about a man who was messed up, a man who was broken, a man who couldn't, who couldn't help himself, a man who his friends couldn't help him. And he met Jesus, and I'm telling you, he established a personal relationship. He gets free from his demons, and now he has a purpose in life. His purpose is to share the good news of Jesus uh, with, with, with his people, with people who don't know who Jesus, who Jesus is. I'm going to, I'm going to tell you a story. Um, I had a, I have a friend of mine and he went out to start this church in a, in a, in a small area in a small city. And, um, man, he was trying so hard. He was doing everything that he possibly could. And he could not get the church off the ground. They weren't having many people. He had tried everything. He had tried advertising. He had tried going door to door, knocking and telling people. He had done all this. And he's walking down the street, the, the main street in their little city. And there passed out on a, on a bench was the town drunk named Johnny. And he's walking by him. He's trying to walk away from him because, you know, Johnny stink, he was drunk, and he was passed out. And the Holy Spirit said, I want you to minister to Johnny. And he said, Lord, I can't even minister to the regular people in town. How am I going to minister to Johnny? He said, I want you to minister to Johnny. Your goal in life is no longer to start the church. Your goal is to get Johnny saved. And so he, he, every day he started going and talking to, to Johnny. There were certain parts of the day that were better because he was going to be hungover. Well, guess what? Johnny gave his life to Jesus. And Johnny got set free from alcohol. And Johnny brought his whole family to church. And Johnny brought his co-workers to church. And everyone in town said, I have to go to this church because if it has the power to, to make Johnny normal, that's enough for me. And his church filled up with people because he ministered to the town drunk. Can you imagine? And this town drunk, he met Jesus. He got delivered from his demons. He found freedom. He discovered his purpose. If God can heal me, he can heal everyone else. He was going out there, Johnny was going out there saying, listen, you just think you have problems. Did you see me? Look at me now. I'm sober. I haven't drank in six weeks. And man, filling the church up with people. God has a purpose for your life. If you're watching this morning, I'm telling you, God has a specific plan and a purpose for your life. But you, you can't accomplish that pur purpose. You can't fulfill that purpose till number one, you have a personal encounter with Jesus Christ. And number two, you find freedom. You can't help other people until you help yourself. You have to allow God to come in and help you. You have to let God to come in and remember our verse from 1 Thessalonians, to sanctify you through and through. The fourth thing is this. This man he made a difference with his life. He made a difference. This man has now, now has an established a relationship with Jesus. He's been delivered from the hurts. He's discovered his purpose. He becomes a missionary to the Decapolis, all these 10 cities. And he, he sets out with passion to make a difference in the lives of other people. I, I want to, please, if I could please say something in a very humble way this morning. God's plan for you is more about other people than it is you. You see, sometimes we're not saved to be selfish. 
We're not saved just to better ourselves. We're saved. So yeah, God can come in and work in our lives, but it overflows to other purpose. So God's ultimate goal for you, it gets beyond yourself and to help other people, but you'll never be able to do that until you allow God to work in your life first. So as I conclude this morning, I just have a question for you. Are you going to discover the new normal in your spiritual life? You know, things are changing all around us. Maybe it's time for you to find a new normal spiritually. Uh, We've talked about the spiritual journey that God has for all of us to know God personally, to find freedom for their hurts, to discover your purpose, and to make a difference in the world. Are you ready for something new? Are you ready for something fresh? And maybe you're saying, Terry, I've tried religion. We said earlier, burn religion, get rid of it. It's all about a relationship with Jesus. Here's an important truth. The spiritual journey starts by you making a choice. You have to decide to go on the journey. Uh, It's not forced on you. God doesn't force you to go on a spiritual journey, but he's presented it to all of us. He's laid it out there for all of us. And here's the good news. It doesn't matter how bad you think you are. It doesn't matter how much you've messed up. The spiritual journey is available to everyone. If it's available to a man named that was called by the demons legion because he has so many unclean spirits in his life, I think you and I, I think we're okay. I'm gonna pray for you this morning. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna pray for those. Maybe you're here, maybe you're watching, and you started the spiritual journey. You gave your life to the Lord, and then you, then you just quit. You know you're saved, but you, know, you haven't allowed God to come in and, and get freedom from the things, the past hurts, anxieties, things that has been put on you. And today you say, you know, Terry, I need a new normal for my spiritual life. And the four steps you talked about, they, they sound so appealing. They sound so amazing. I want that in my life. I want to be free. I want to discover my purpose. I want to be a blessing to other people. So if that's you today, would you just raise your hands, just close your eyes, just bow, bow with me. Father God, I pray for all the people watching this morning. God, you, you designed for them to watch it, watch this today, just like you had a plan when Jesus went to the region of the Gerasenes and that one day changed this man's life. God, this day is meant to change some lives. So if, if you started the journey, but you hadn't, hadn't kept going, just say, Father God, Please forgive me. I want to grow with you. I want my spiritual life to be healthy and growing and vibrant. And I want to find freedom in my life. I want to discover my purpose in life. And I want to get myself in a place to where I can be a blessing and I can benefit other people around me. God, right now, I just ask that you're working in lives of your people today. Lord, you love everybody and I pray that just as you worked in this man's life in the garrisons who was demon-possessed, you're working in lives right now, God. I just pray that the Holy Spirit's touching hearts right now, God, that are never going to be the same in Jesus' name. Now, most importantly, before we conclude today, there are probably many of you watching, and you've never started your spiritual journey. And I'm telling you, it's great news Today is your day. Today is a day for you to meet Jesus and have a personal encounter with him that will transform your life. And so if you say, Terry, I'm ready. I'm ready for something new. I'm ready for a new normal. I'm ready for something fresh. I'm ready to go beyond where I've been. We're just gonna commit our lives to Jesus this morning. Just say, Father God, I'm so thankful that you sent your son, Jesus, into the world as the vaccine and the cure for sin. And today I ask Jesus to come into my heart. Today I submit my life totally to him. I ask him to be the Lord and the savior of my life and do for me 
what he did for the man in our story today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Listen, if you did that today, I'm telling you, your life is going to be transformed. You have Jesus living inside of you. And uh, listen, if you, if you prayed that prayer, uh, please go to our website or contact us through our live stream. We would love to get you some information. We would love to pray for you and help you to keep growing. Well, we're going to close with a worship song this morning. And just a reminder, we're just a couple weeks away, church. It's not going to be much longer uh, till we're meeting in person again. And of course, we'll still keep sending our, a live stream out. But we're just believing here that by June 7th, the first Sunday in June, we're going to be meeting together. Uh, again, we miss you. Tracy and I, we miss you. We love you. We can't wait to be able to see you uh, face to face again. God bless you. And let's worship with the worship team. We appreciate them. One more moment before we dismiss today.